the sales after dark subject. So let me see what's been happening today. A lot of things have been happening today. It's getting really hot here in Georgia. That's the big thing. The weather is changing. But I uh, want to talk a little bit about sales. I'm going to cover a topic that, I, again, I think it'll be very interesting. And again, if you're watching this on the replay, as I always say, skip to the first five minutes and I'll jump into the content then. So uh, if you're on live, got a couple of folks jumping on already. I love it, man. Hit the chat. Let me know where you're from. I always appreciate that, man. I got a great international crowd. I, so I'm trying to do these a little later so my international folks can get up early in the morning and check these out. So I'm doing my best, doing my best. So, oh man, numbers keep going up. I love it. So again, hit the chat. Let me know where you're from. And we'll get going in about, I'm going to say, let me see, I got, a, I got the one minute mark. I'm going to get going in about four minutes. Paco LeBron, my man out of Chicago, man. Hope you're staying safe. Ah. Uh, all right, so Dubai in the house again. Love Dubai, man. These guys. You're all, dude, you're always around, man. I love it, man. And watching live from Central Illinois. Hometown. Hometown. Let me see. Uh, Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Mike Janice. My man, I know you. That's cool. Got the mascot and everything on there. Hey, by the way, how do you guys find out that I'm going live? Is it because you just registered to my uh, the YouTube? How do you get it? Because some people keep asking me, Victor, I don't get any notifications. So how do you get your notification? How do you get your... All right, Hemingway, find the house. There you go. Love it, man. Chase Gamble, San Antonio. Chase, I don't think I remember your name, man. This is, your, is this your first time out here? Live, man, let me know, Chase. And then we got Morocco. I don't know. Morocco's starting to become a favorite of mine, man. You know, Morocco jumps on board. You're like, yeah, love it, man. All right, Morocco, good for you, man. Uh, let's see. So you two did send you a notification, Hemingway. All right, cool. Uh, Carlos Avilas, I'm doing good, man. I am doing good, man. Coming in from Facebook, I love it, man. Mike, Mike, you got the, oh, you got the Facebook notifications. So yeah, I think the notifications are going out. And down the road, I do plan to kind of just schedule. You pop on my screen when you go live. I, is, is that a good thing or a bad thing, Debbie? I don't know. All right. So anyway, like I said, we'll get started about, let me see what the timer says here. I'm going to start at the five minute mark. We got about two and a half minutes. So if you need to get a little drink, uh, I got my little lime water here. Or if you need to go use the restroom, now would be a good time to do it. Uh, and then let me see, you're notified when, uh, notified once you go live, just tell everyone to press on the ring icon. Cool. On the ring icon, wait a minute, let me read that again. We are notified once you're live, just tell everyone to press on the ring icon. Yeah, you're gonna to help to help me with that one. Uh, saludos desde Peru, hermano. ¿Qué parte de Peru? Lima? Me imagino que sí, ¿no? Okay, wonderful. Uh, yeah, I knew it was gonna be, uh, yeah, I knew it was gonna be early in India, man. So that's, I figured it was a good time. I was gonna to try to move it to like 10 o'clock. <clears throat> PM, uh, like that I can hit almost everybody. I'm starting to think 9 to 10 might be the range I want to do it in, man. Just try to get everybody on board. Uh, let me see. Uh, will you save the live? I have to sleep. Ha <laughs> ha. No, dude, you got to stay up. But yes, it'll be, it'll record live. So whether it's on Facebook, YouTube, or uh, I'm trying to also get it on Twitch to see how that works. Victor, you mad dog. Thank you, Leonardo. I don't know what that means, but I think it's a good thing, right? That's cool. All right. All right. So like I said, we got about one minute before I get started. I'm going to cover an interesting subject today. I'm going to actually do a book review, kind of. Uh, and then we're going to see how it applies to business. And you guys have some questions. We'll get into it. So we'll do that. So let's see. Yeah, good 45 seconds. Got some folks on. Man, I worked with like 28 people. That's not bad, man. And so hopefully everything's been going well on your side. Again, things are opening up here in Georgia. And I'm super excited about this topic. Uh, I'm going to talk about a subject. Uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, people always ask me about my favorite books and, you know, in selling. And so I'm going to reveal to you, and I've mentioned it in the past, one of my favorite books. I think probably, probably one of the most important sales books, you know, that's come out in a very, very long time. Let me see who's here. Let's check it out. Thanks, Victor. How's your day been? So far, so good, man. So far, so good. Uh, if you guys are nice to me, it's going to be even better. Uh, hola, Mariana. Mariana, where are you from? Put it up there. Let's see where you are. Austin, Texas in the house. Sean Allen, man, I'm doing good. Thank you, brother. 
And let me see. Uh, Akshay, selling during the crisis. You could do a video on this. I well, I did uh, the no touch selling one, and that was interesting. The no touch selling is how do you sell at a virtual distance? So if you're part of the Sales Velocity Academy, uh, that program is in there. It's like an hour and a half, maybe two hours. And I talk about all the tools you need, you know, to sell virtually in today's market. Have some great examples, by the way, of companies who are doing exceptionally well. Uh, you'd be amazed. So, all right, we're at the five minute mark, a little over the five minute mark. Let's get going. So, this subject. Now, if you're gonna ask me questions, try to keep it on this subject, you know. Uh, let me see. Uh, do you still have. Do I still have Lightspeed VT? Yes, I have. I use two of them actually. I got Lightspeed VT and I also use Kajabi. So if you're familiar with Kajabi, kajabi.com. It's a, by the way, if you're wondering what he's talking about, uh, it's a learning management system. So um, right now, you know, I use two of them, Lightspeed VT, which is a great company. And I also started using Kajabi because I wanted to try something different. So kajabi.com. So that's where I, I keep the Sales Velocity Academy. So anyway, uh, Palm Springs, that's where you're from, Mariana. Welcome. All right. So let's talk about, again, setting this up. People ask me, Victor, you know, if, you know, I call, I call this the golden shelf. I always talk about the golden shelf. The golden shelf to me are the top 10 books that you would keep, that you would refuse to give away no matter what, right? And so when it comes to like sales and motivation, those are like my two key words, right? Sales and motivation. You know, I have several books, but my go-to books, I mentioned spin selling, and maybe we'll talk about spin selling some other day. But the book that I think, supersedes spin selling, supersedes. So let me back up. In 1997, Neil Rackham did a study that was sponsored by Xerox, uh, and, and that book eventually, uh, that study eventually became spin selling. And spin selling was probably the only book at the time that actually did a real study, you know, like an empirical study. Like a lot of sales books, the majority of sales books are just opinions based on a person's experience, right? But spin selling was an actual book done. I mean, studied with data. It was empirical. So fast forward uh, to 2009, uh, a group by the name of CEB, the Council Executive Board, which is now Gartner, by the way, did this large study on salespeople. And the book was published. It was, by the way, that report was turned into a book, which was published in 2011 called The Challenger Sale. And you may have heard of this book. It's called The Challenger. Let me just change my markers here. It's called The Challenger Sale, and let me just get this going here. And so, The Challenger Sale. And this book, I think, is awesome. I mean, if you're in B2B, so I'm going to say B2B, and maybe not transactional retail. I mean, I guess you could use it for retail. Maybe we'll try to tie it into retail a little bit. But this book was really designed around B2B type of sales systems, right? But if you're a small business owner, you can use some of this. If you have to do presentations, you can use some of this. If you have to talk to your manager about a bigger budget, you can use this, okay? So the Challenger Sale, if you read the Challenger Sale, hit me with the one. If you read the Challenger Sale, just hit me with the one. And I got a couple more people jumping on board, man. Thank you for joining me. Uh, it's gonna be cool. All right, so the Challenger Sale. So here, now check this out. The, here's why I'm gonna highlight the book. And by the way, I can't do the book justice, right? I was written by um, Brett Adamson and Matt Dixon. Uh, and I follow Matt Dixon a lot on Twitter because I, I love his content. Uh, so I'll just say Matt Dixon and uh, uh, Brent Adamson. Adamson. And I follow, I think, Matt. He does more updates. Uh, I follow Matt on Twitter. And by the way, the way I use Twitter, I don't know. I'm just going to throw this out there just as a recommendation. I don't follow a lot of people on Twitter. I think if you go to my, my Twitter account, just go to at Victor Antonio. Check it out right now if you want. I think I only follow like six or seven people. And people always ask me, why don't you follow more people? I said, well, because, you know, my brain says, you know, follow people that you, you value, that they're giving you the content you need. Like, all of us are on a different journey when it comes to learning, right? And so I only follow people that are going to add to that journey. And over the year, it does change. You know, sometimes I add more. Sometimes I take away people who are you know, on a different topic now, or maybe I'm not interested in the topic. So that's the way I use Twitter strategically. I only follow people who produce great content. Uh, I don't follow people with opinions. You know what I'm talking about, right? Just, just to stay positive. Back to the book. So... So in 2009, the CEB, the Council Executive Board, which is now Gartner, 
says, hey, let's study salespeople. Let's figure out, you know, how do we categorize salespeople? And what they did is they came up with, a, with, a, with five types of salespeople. Five types of salespeople. And so let me just expand this right here. So these five types of salespeople, like I put the five bubbles here so I wouldn't forget. So what they did is they go, let's look at the five types of salespeople. Let me define them first and then let's have a discussion. The first one is uh, the challenger, right? And this is a person who is going to challenge the customer. When the customer says something, they're going to, they're going to push back, they're going to challenge. Then there was the lone wolf. The lone wolf. Have you had, if you're a manager, you've probably had a lone wolf. A lone wolf is, is that type of salesperson that doesn't listen to anybody, does it their own way. It's all gut instinct. And if you ask them, how, how do you sell well? They go, I don't know. It's just natural for me. And they like to work alone. That's the lone wolf. Then they did the relationship seller, right? The relationship seller, I don't need to explain that one too much, do I? The relationship, these are people who love to build relationships with their customers. Then there was the hard worker, the hard worker, and then there was the problem solver. This, the problem solver, by the way, the hard worker is just a grinder, just going for it, just grinding, 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 right? The problem solver is that person that is always going to be very responsive to the actual clients, right? So they're very responsive. So here's the beautiful thing. These are the five archetypes, they call it, like five types of salespeople in the market. Now, it's important to note that you, as a salesperson, have a little bit of all of them. Okay, we all have a little bit of all of them, but there's one. If these are five modes, there's always one that's dominant. Okay, so we all have all five, all of your hard workers, all of your problem solvers, great relationship, you can challenge your customer, and sometimes you just go rogue and you want to do it your way, right? So you're all five. But for each of you, there's one mode that dominates. And so my question to you is, let's, let's do this real quick. Do you think you're more one, the challenger? Two, lone wolf. Three, the relationship builder. Four and five. Just kind of write your number down. Write your number who you think you are more, right? Who do you think you are? Are you more one, two, three, four, five? Mike Janice has read the challenger sale. Way to go, Mike. Appreciate that. Uh, Hunter Harrington, Amerikanski, sell for us. That reminds me of that song. Remember, I fight the power. Amerikanski, transepta, now Sputnik. I never knew what it meant, but it was a great song. Fight the power. Three. Jim says three. Leonardo says five, the problem solver. Uh, Gloria says five. Diane, as a rep, three, as a manager, one. Oh, I, like, I like the way you sliced that one. That was well done, well done. Joe, you're, you're saying no, one. And so again, we got little kiddo says five. Dude, the problem solver, like to solve it. Mike Janice is on three, the relationship, excellent. Herb is doing a one. So you guys are kind of all over the board. I didn't even see a lone wolf. Nobody wants to admit they're a lone wolf. That's funny. <laughs> Nobody wants to admit they're a lone wolf. Uh, Debbie Johnson says number three. Jesus Enriquez says he's number five. Herb again says one. No twos, no lone wolves. I don't believe this. I know somewhere out there is a lone wolf, right? Now, the next part of this was they asked the question. Now, here's the question. It's a very, let me, let me, let me just kind of light these up. So you got them all down. Let me see if I can move this over a little bit and I'll just try to keep that there. Now, what they wanted to find out in this study, and this is important for our time now. Somebody mentioned talk about selling in a crisis. <clears throat> if, the, if the product you're selling, if the product you're selling is complex, it's a complex product, which profile, come on, take the test with me, take the test with me, which profile will do the best? If you're selling a complex product, which profile would do the best? Let me go back to them. Which profile would do the best? Challenger is one, Lone Wolf is two, Relationship is three, hard work is four, problem solver is five. Okay, which one? So write these down. I want you to write these down and take notes, okay? So keep track of them. So in a complex product, what's your answer? You should have one answer here, okay? In a simple product, a simple transactional sale, simple sale, right? In other words, not that complicated. Who do you think would win? Who do you think would win? Challenger, Lone Wolf, Relationship, 
hard worker, problem solver. Okay? Now, got your answers down? Hold that thought. Now, one more. If you have a co an economy that's doing well, like phew, we were like three months ago, if we have an economy that's doing well, so if, in other words, if you have a, if it's a good, we'll call it a good econ, who do you think does well? Okay, write your notes down. You're gonna have to have four answers for this, okay? So just make sure you have them down. Is it a one, challenger, good, e good economy, two, lone wolf, three, relationship, four, hard worker, Bam, problem solver, okay? Still not seeing, oh, I got a lone wolf. Kodo says he's a lone wolf. Make sure I got that one right. Hold on, let me slide you over, man. I wanna make sure I got that name right. Let me see, boom. Katsu, do I have it right, man? It's either that or Hatsu. I think Katsu, probably, all right? Cool, all right, so we got him, right? All right, last question. In a down economy, who does best? Who does best? Who does best, all right? You with me? Now, do you have four answers? Just, I'm assuming you have four answers, right? Now, who do you think, go back to all these, let's go back to all these. Now, right next to this, draw a line like that. And right next to it, right, who does the worst? So in other words, who does the best, but who does the worst? <clears throat> in a complex sales situation, which one of these struggle? When selling a simple product, who's struggling? And again, I'm simplifying the study. So again, you gotta read the book. I'm just giving you the simple version, my version of it. In a good economy, who does the worst? In a down economy, who does the worst? Okay, all right, so you're with me. So down three, got it. All right, so now, let me just skip this right here. So here was the shocker. When you're selling a complex product, when we're looking on the spectrum of complexity, the winner, the winner, two ends, the winner is, you got it, the challenger. In a down economy, or an up economy, but mostly I say a down, who wins? Who do you think wins? The answer is, the same. The challenger. <clears throat> Who does the worst? The big R. The relationship salespeople did the worst. Think about that for a second. That's kind of a mind blower, isn't it? Because you're talking about, it's all about relationships. But Victor, even you're probably thinking right now, I don't believe you, Victor. I'm just saying, I'm following the data. But it makes sense. If you think about this, remember, this is a B2B study, B2B scenario. And I'm just giving you the simplified, watered down version of the results. Uh, it's interesting when you read the book, you really get into some of the detail and why this is so, but let's explain the psychology of why this might be and how is it possible that the relationship salesperson isn't doing the best. Now keep in mind, this is where somebody, many people misunderstood the book. You have all five of these modes. So in other words, you have all five of these. You're, you're, you're a challenger at times, you're a lone wolf at times, you're a relationship person at times, you're a hard worker at times, and you're a problem solver. But you have one dominant mode. And the, the mode that wins the most, based on the data, based on the data, I think it was 6,000 uh, request responses they got to survey this, and that number has increased since then, and the data's still holding. Now, so how is it possible that the relationship salesperson isn't winning? Because that's how it used to be, right? And then when I read the data, like many of you probably, I go, that doesn't make sense. You know, it's like, ah, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. But the more I thought about it, I go, it does make sense because something has changed. Let's walk through it. This is kind of cool. So when you look at, so again, I'm a little older than probably a couple of you, right? By that, I mean a lot of you, right? And so I want you to kind of split the world as I always do. There was a time there was a time where there was no internet. Before the internet. I know, I know, millennials and Gen Xers are going, I never knew a time existed. Believe me, there was a time. Before the internet existed, you as an individual, when you wanted to search or buy something rather, you probably had maybe, and this is just a, a, a relative number, 20, 30% of the information 
you need it to make a buying decision. So you only have 20, 30% of the information you need to buy, make a buying decision, which means, let's take an example. And I use this example all the time. Back then, before the internet, if I asked you, how did you decide you know, what new car you were gonna get? So your car breaks down one too many times, you're saying, I'm gonna get a new car. How did you decide back then? Well, typically you would check the newspaper or you would ask friends, you look at the classifieds, you know, you would just kind of ask people, you know, there was no Craigslist. There was no, you know, uh, you know, consumer, well, there was a consumer magazine, but not a lot of people had access to that. But many people would just use social proof. They'd see what people were driving and they would say, what do you think of your car? Is that a good car? Maybe I should get one. So here's what happens. When they got to the dealership, when they went to buy a car at the dealership, if height represents knowledge, they may have had 20, 30% of the knowledge they needed to make a buying decision, which means that if you don't have enough information to make a buying decision, when a salesperson approaches you, you're gonna ask a lot of questions because you wanna be comfortable and you wanna be sure that the decision is a good one. So during that time, it was good to be a relationship salesperson because you wanted to establish a good relationship with the client. You also wanted to give them valuable information. So the client really wanted that relationship. And typically you would spend two, three, maybe four hours at a dealership. Some are even averaging five hours at a dealership, right? And during that time, you know, again, you're, you're looking at the car, but you're also, you know, the salesperson's getting to know you. There's a relationship there, so forth and so on. So there's a bond that's established, right? But now let's fast forward. Now we have the internet. Today, and I mentioned this in my last live session, because we have the internet, the majority of you, if not all of us, go online and do our research, right? First thing we do, Google, boom. And then we Google it, right? And I mentioned last on the last stream that typically we look at 10 sources of information. So now what happens, now when you, the buyer, arrive at the dealership, you're well informed. So if height represents knowledge, you're way up here. You know, you're like, you probably have 90%, up to 90% of the information you need to make a buying decision. So when you arrive at the dealership, you've done your research. So are you looking for a relationship or a transaction? Can I venture to guess that you're looking for a transaction? You've done the research. You know what you want. You know what price to pay. You know what the blue book value is. If it's, if it's a used car, you know, you know what the mileage should be, so forth and so on. You've made comparisons with anything within 50 miles, whatever it may be. You have the data. You have the power. So you don't want a relationship. You don't want the salesperson to keep you there for three or four hours. You want to get there. Here's what I want. Here's what I'm willing to pay. Are you willing to do this? Boom. Transactional. So that's what's changed because there's so many products in the market today, so many service providers in the market today, and as I mentioned already, everybody looks the same. Everybody looks the same. And so tell me what you think of what I just said, because this, it's, you know, a lot of us, a lot of us don't want to deal with a salesperson anymore. Studies have shown this, less and less, even executives don't want to deal with salespeople because they don't see them as adding value. So what does this mean? How is it that the challenger wins? Well, the challenger is a person that, okay, well, let's step back. We now know that relationship, we know that relationships are important, but here's what most people don't think about. The relationship is a result of a good sale. Let me say it again. We always think a relationship is having a great relationship up front, getting the clients or clients within that company to buy from us, and we continue that relationship. So our view of selling is relationship, right? Make the sale and post sale support, continue that great relationship. So they'll what? Make another sale and buy again, right? So you can do the upsell, the cross sell over here, establish a good relationship, grab the sale, right? Continue the post sales relationship support and then upsell them across them. That's kind of a sales sequence right there. But here's what's happening. You're talking to, let's say, a CXO here. By CXO, I mean CEO, CIO, CTO, you name it, right? And every day of every week, they're getting pitched. People are pitching them, always trying to sell them something, right? And they got 10 vendors a week coming in, 20 vendors a week coming in to pitch them. Everybody's got content. Everybody's got the greatest product. Everybody's got the greatest service. Everybody's got the product that they need and people get tired of hearing that. And so what happens is, when you get there, they, they don't have time for small talk. They wanna know, get to the point, I'm trying to buy a solution, what do you got? So in today's market, you don't wanna start selling here. 
this has almost become non-existent. Now, this is not to say that you're not going to be nice to people, that you're not going to introduce yourself, be polite. I'm not saying that. But if relationship, let me just undo this and say it this way, that if the relationship was took this long to create, what customers are looking for you is to shorten that R, and maybe instead of relationship, you build some great rapport at the beginning, but they want you to get to the solution real quick. Why are you here, Victor? Tell me what you have that can help me. Tell me what you, you're selling that will help my business. That's what they want to know. And here's the irony, well, not irony, the paradox, so to speak. If you can show them that your product is a great solution and you come in there, and I'm gonna show you how to do this. If you can walk into that meeting and be a challenger, which means you're gonna sell differently, and I'm gonna show you what the book highlights, and this is why I think it's powerful. If you can do this and you sell them a solution that I'll just put a check mark that works, that really helps them, then guess what they wanna have from you? Now they want a relationship. This is what I mean, that it's not that you don't have or try to establish some type of rapport relationship. A relationship to me is something over time. But when we're talking to customers today who don't have a lot of time, the most we can build is not a relationship, but we can build some rapport. We'll call that the small r, right? Relationship, small r, rapport. You get to the solution phase where you present the solution. You remember one of my live streams I talked about the hero story? Same thing, again, address their issues right away let them know how you can help them and if they buy from you and it works and it really does help them they're going to want the big r which is the relationship so again i'm not saying the relationship isn't important because this is where everybody gets screwed up you have all five there's a dominant mode of selling and this book highlights that the dominant mode of selling in today's market and i'm talking specifically of the b2b situation the challenger is the winner the relationship person, whether the economy's up or down, typically does the worst. And I tell this to people, and I, they argue with me, and I just said, well, read the book, read the data, but it makes sense if you think about it. What do you have to say? Uh, Jim says, let's get some comments going here. So Jim, you're saying the relationship overused. I'm with you, I think it is. Again, I'm not saying, I think we're saying the same thing. It's not that it's not valid, it is valid, but it's a, it's a result of a great business transaction. Think about that for a second. A relationship is a result of us working together and it's going well. Man, I definitely want a great relationship. Let me see what Jesus has to say here. Jesus says, just like the effortless experience book, reducing friction, exactly. By the way, I'm gonna review that book also. I think that is one of the most important books also. That made my golden top 10, by the way. The Effortless Experience. If you're into, and I'm glad you brought it up, Jesus, thank you very much, that if you're into customer service, you need to read this book. Because this book talks about, it's not about wowing your clients. It's not about trying to get the wow. You ever see these books? They're like, how to wow your clients. This one will shatter that myth, will shatter the myth. And it will give you an idea of what customers are looking for today. And as Jesus points out here, it is reducing that friction. And so that's a great book, man. So I'm glad you brought that up. Leonardo, uh, I don't know if that's, well, let me get into this part and you can tell me if it sounds similar to the straight line. I don't think so. Here's the big difference. Jordan Belfort doesn't have any data. It's right here. That's not a put down. So let me be clear. That's not a put down. This is an actual study. Also keep in mind that in many cases, Jordan Belfort's sales system is most, I don't want to say it's all B2B, but it's mostly B2B, B2C rather. Do you know what I mean? So when you're dealing with, let's say a technology company, complex sale, nine different buyers that are invited, are involved, I don't think that's gonna cut it for you. But like anything else, there's some great similarities. And by the way, for those of you who don't know about the straight line uh, system by Jordan Balfour, look it up. He's got a couple of videos online, great videos. And again, as I always say, let's not be binary about things. Oh, this one's better than that. That one's better than that. No, there's no such thing. There are no absolutes in selling. What I try to do, and my friend here is also doing, is that, like Leonardo, you try to grab what? You try to grab the best of the best and everybody has something to offer. Your job is to figure out what fits for your selling style and what would make you comfortable and what strategies work. And then you're gonna try some, some work, some don't, and you keep modifying it. So again, look up his stuff. Uh, let me see, Mike, focus on the title of the customer, what they might be looking for to get to the meat. That's exactly it. Once you understand the customer, and we talked about that in the last one, we talked about empathy. Understand who that customer is. 
and understand, I hate to use the phrase, what keeps them up at night, but I, I like to use the phrase, what are their motivations? What are, they, what are they struggling with? What are they having problems with? And then let's take our product and say, I wonder if this can help. And let me show you how I can help you. That's exactly the conversation. Uh, Jim is talking about, uh, yeah, Jordan Belfort, yeah, he's, he's the wolf. And cross-pollination, figure out what, what works best for you. So don't fall into that trap about, you know, again, one system is, is better than the other, so forth and so on. And so I got something here that says, Luis Farias. Lorena, I don't know what that means, but if you could hit me up with more data, I'd be more than happy to uh, go back to it. My customers really appreciate my efficiency. I hear you, brother. Again, it's, it's a little bit of everything, right? You got to be a hard worker. You got to be a problem solver, relationship. Once in a while, you got to go rogue, help your customer out, be that lone wolf, and then challenge. So this brings us to the big question. What is, what does a challenger do? What does a challenger do that makes them good at what they do? And so they gave us a little model to go with. So let me go through the model and then let's talk about the model and then we can wrap up and we can take some questions if you want. So a challenger, and again, I just gotta keep saying this because I really want you to read the book because I, th I think it's so rich in data and content that I can't really cover here or really describe and give it its full credit. So they said a challenger typically does three things and it's like a Venn diagram and they all overlap. The first one is, and I think this one's interesting, is that, and I think you get this one, they tailor for resonance, for resonance, right? Now, what does that mean, tailor for resonance? I like that phrase. Is when he says tailor for resonance, in other words, instead of just giving, you ever have people just come in and do a standard presentation? Tailor for resonance means you, before you walk through that door, you already understand the customer. You understand their market, you understand their products, you understand their competitors, you understand their history. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, Michael Porter's Five Forces, uh, maybe I'll cover that in another one. Uh, by the way, before I forget to mention, so these models, this one also is in my book, Sales Models, okay? So again, I think, I I'm not trying to sell you on the book, but it is a good book because it has all these different models in there. And I do cover, I think, Michael Porter's Five Forces model, which is another conversation, but anyway. My point is, if you understand the customer, you understand what they're going through, struggling with, their market, their products, who their clients are, what they're struggling with, and then you can tailor your presentation for that conversation. So it'd be very industry specific, maybe be so niche that people go, yeah, you understand our business. And that's, you know, that's what you want to transmit. Tailor for resonance. The other thing they do is they teach, and this one was interesting, for differentiation right? They teach for differentiation. In other words, let's say you're selling some type of complex software platform, B2B scenario, right? So you already demonstrated that you understand their market. So you already tailored your presentation, but now they want to know why this one versus this one, like the five whys, why this one, why now, why change, why you, why this company? So they want to know what's the difference. And this becomes a very tough thing to do. Teaching for differentiation really requires you to be very good at understanding your business and how it's going to impact their business. Now, let me pause because if you understand what I'm about to tell you, if you understand what I'm about to tell you, you'll really be good at selling and you'll understand why the best of the best sell. Let's assume, for example, that you're selling a product and I'm selling pretty much the same product, right? You and me, two salespeople, going after one client, right? We can have the same product. Now, the product, if you tip, think about it, when, we, when people talk about product differentiation, that's usually what they mean. That's what usually what comes to mind, differentiation, right? Which is product differentiation, service differentiation. But there's another way of looking at differentiation that most people don't talk about. In fact, I've not heard anybody really talk this way. And that differentiation comes from how you frame your product in the customer's eyes. It's how you frame it that creates the differentiation. For example, in the, mo in the most simplest example, you're the salesperson I'm competing with. You go in there, you do your presentation, and you show them how your product can help them, let's say, increase revenue. And you're like, here's how it's gonna help you increase revenue. And it's a great presentation you do. Now, I'm gonna follow you but I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna show how it's gonna increase revenue, and they're gonna say, yeah, we know that already. But then I say, wait a minute, 
I'm going to go deeper. Like Inception, let's go deeper, right? And I'm going to say, let me show you how it's going to reduce your cost as well. And then I give them examples that my other competitor salesperson didn't do. And then I layer another Inception on and I go, and let me show you how by increasing your revenue, reducing the cost, I'm going to help you and maybe guide you on how you're going to be able to expand your market share. Now, same product, same product, they do the same thing, except I framed it differently. That's the part of the differentiation. That's, that's what I call, that's the teaching for differentiation because the customer is going to say, huh, uh, the other guy didn't tell us that, you know, she came in, she never mentioned that, she never looked. So I want to go with Victor. Victor seems to understand the different levels of how this product can help us. And all of a sudden I differentiated myself, now with a different product, just how I present it, which is why product presentation is a form of differentiation. Keep that in mind. The third part, this one's tough. This is something that most people just don't get. Take control of the conversation. Now, that's conversation. Take control of the convert. Let me just spell it out. Conversation, okay? Take control of the conversation. Now, you've been taught, I'm assuming right now, I could be wrong. Many of us have been taught that, you know what? You just, as a salesperson, you know, you got to let the customer talk all the time. You got to just listen. And then you hear this one. First of all, what did I say? Listen with two ears and talk with one. Use them in that ratio or that proportion, right? List twice as much as you talk, right? And then they'll say, and remember, the customer is always right. And the answer is, no, they're not. The customer is not always right. And what customers want today is they don't want yes people walking into their office, people who try to appease them or pl placate them. What they want, real business leaders, what they want is for somebody to come in and challenge them. I know this works because I use it all the time. I challenge people who say things to me. And I go, no, that's not it. Or they, they'll say something. I go, no. I said, let me, let me get, by the way, my gentle line, the line I always use, I said, do you mind if I push back on that a little bit? And they always say, go ahead. Push back, Victor. I said, you know what I mean? And so I always say that, well, let me push back a little bit on that one because I, I think we need to look at it from different angles. And what I'm doing is I'm challenging them. I'm challenging their assumptions. And if you're dealing with a great leader, they'll go, go ahead, push back. Let me see what you got. And all of a sudden, you begin to have this new level of dialogue. It's beyond the niceties. It's like you're challenging each other. And it's in that challenge, it's in that conversation, it's in that back and forth, the give and take, that, that relationship, that rapport begins, a small r begins to form. And the, what, what the customer begins to notice is, okay, he knows what he's talking about. You know, and he's challenging me, and I'm not trying to be offensive. By the way, when we say take control of the conversation, this does not mean you have gotta be a jerk and disagree with the customer just for the sake of disagreeing. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying have a good conversation. And if there's something the customer says that you disagree with, or maybe even slightly disagree with, just ask for clarification. You said this, and that our product would only do that or be used in this. Can I expand on that? Because I think you might not see something that's maybe right in front of you. They're gonna go, what am I not seeing, Victor? Well, let me walk you through it, and you walk them through it. And so these are the things. So this is what challengers do. This is what the best of the best salespeople do. Now, keep in mind that once you sell, once you close the deal, this is gonna shift into more of a relationship situation. But notice that if you do this correctly, what did you establish yourself as? As a domain expert, as a person who knows and really wants to help them grow their business. That's what customers want from you. And if you can do that, you can do that, you're gonna sell differently. So, go through it again. Tailor for residents, understand who you're selling to who you're talking to. Teach for differentiation. Again, sometimes it's not that the product or service is different, it's just that you present it in such a way that the customer goes, huh, never looked at it that way. And again, it's the same product. And the take control is the biggest one. Most salespeople are afraid to take control of the conversation because you think you're gonna come across as a bully or a jerk or you're gonna, you know, you're gonna come off as too aggressive. Taking control of the conversation has nothing to do with being aggressive. Let me be clear on that. It has nothing to do with being aggressive. It has everything to do with you caring so much for the customer that you're willing to challenge them. You see the difference? You're not being aggressive like trying to push them. You're saying, you know, I don't think you're looking at it right, and I really care about how you think because if you can understand what I'm saying, maybe you can see the value of what I'm really offering. That's the type of challenging that should go on. So anyway, 
that's it. Again, the Challenger sale, check it out. And if you guys have any questions, I'll take some of those and we can just have some fun, hang out. Uh, yep, Jim said trusted advisor. And that, that's really what you're trying to do with all three, right? You're just trying to become a trusted advisor. And like I said, I got examples of, of, of dealing with challengers. And so I've seen it work, man, over and over again. Uh, again, step one of the straight line. You can compare it to, keep in mind that there's so many different sales models out there. I mean, we're talking even before uh, the, the Jordan Belfort straight line. I mean, you can go back to the earliest book I have on sales. It's like a, it's 1914. And a lot of those principles still apply today. It's amazing that it was the, um, uh, the National Cash Register. If you remember those old cash registers, NCR. NCR back in, I think it was 1914, was the first company to actually put together a sales training program. And a lot of those concepts are still used today. So nobody can lay claim to a lot of these things. Again, everything is about evolution and different sales models. So uh, Jim says, would it be crazy to give you some pushback? No, man, I love that. You want to do that now? Dude, give me your pushback, man, of course. But I would love it because, now see, what I love about that question is that it's, first of all, you inserted the word crazy. This is why I love about that question. All right, would it be crazy? Like, would it be crazy? That's kind of a pattern interrupt, right? Would it be crazy to give you some pushback? The majority of people are going to say, why? No, it wouldn't be crazy at all. What do you got? Right? It's a great line. And people will, again, if you say it in such a way, it's beautiful. And I think you also had this right here. It increased respect and credibility. Absolutely. Uh, taking control is often a stress reliever for the client. Many times they want an expert of which to depend on so they don't have to fill that role. Herb, you know, what you're saying is, is, is so true in many ways is that some re realize that customers today are overwhelmed. I just told you that if it's CXO, they got 10, 20 people coming in their office a week trying to sell them something. And when there's so many options, that they, they, the mind just gets confused. We know the phrase, right? A confused mind will never make a decision. And what buyers want, believe it or not, is for you to first gain their trust and then hold their hand. And in that order, by the way, right? If you can gain their trust and hold their hand, they're, they're gonna want you to help them make the decision because if you're a true, as somebody already talked about, domain expert, a subject matter expert, they want your opinion because maybe you see something they don't. And that's how you as a salesperson should view yourself, that you know more of the product than they do. And that's why you're there to give them the best of your advice. So I love the way you said that, Matt. It's a great phrase, Matt. I love that. Uh, let me see. Uh, that's framing for differentiation, okay? Not by instinct, okay. I don't know what that means, Jim. I think I think you're trying to tell me something, but you're, you're there's too many bits and bytes here. Uh, get Dutch Apartments time sharing call, uh, Hunter, dude. I don't know what I don't know what that means, man. Call, is this like a promotional thing, Hunter? <laughs> okay, let's get back to it. By the way, if it's not, if you can clarify it, man, I'd be more than happy to check it out. All right. Ivan Garcia out of Florida, always calls me the VIC, never really calls me my full name. We've been friends. That's a great sales guy, by the way. That guy can sell. That guy can sell. So Ivan, glad to have you on here, man. Cross pollination. Uh, so I think, I think we're good with the questions. How about this one? JM, how to best impress the numbers guy, analytical type of buyer? How best to impress him? Uh, well, you know, it's, it's almost like, you know, they're always going to look for, let's say in a, in a B2B scenario, you know, they're looking for numbers, right? And so if you're talking to an economic buyer, we talked about this, I think, in two streams ago, and I think you were on there, right, Jay, the economic buyer? And so what I would do is say, okay, if I got an economic buyer, right? You got an economic buyer. Let's you and I, come on, let's, let's do a team brainstorming session right here about the analytical buyer, right? Let's help Jay out. What is this person worried about? You're selling a, let's say, a software, a box, a black box. You're selling it. Give me some comments here. What is the worries about? What is the number guy worried about? Of course, he's worried about what? I got the obvious. He's worried about numbers. But let's let's be the economic buyer for a second. Be that purchasing person. You're going to make the buying decision. This is a good exercise to go through right now. You're going to make the buying decision, Jay. Come on, man. Tell me. What is he worried about? What do we got? Impress... How to impress, how to, how to best impress. This, okay, that was the question, got it. Uh, let me see what Jim has for us. When someone responds to it, it's done by instinct, that's why I use it. 
would it be crazy? Oh yeah, I get what you. Yeah, it is. It's so back to your question that would it be crazy to give you a little pushback? It is. It's almost like it's not even a, a conscious thought. It's like stimulus response, right? It's like it's just the reaction. So you're absolutely right. Now I got you. Now I got you. Uh, let me see. Don't pretend to be a numbers guy. Okay, I don't know that one. Uh, Leonard Murray says how uh, how still lost. Help me out on this one. Come on, you guys, let's work as a team here. You're selling to an economic buyer. You're gonna go, you're gonna go into purchasing. Of course, price is an issue. Okay, so let's just put the price down. They're gonna worry about price. But what is that economic buyer really worried about? See, this is where, if, unless you can get into their head, you can't tailor for resonance. In other words, if I can't understand what they're struggling with, then I can't tailor my presentation for them. So this is why maybe sometimes we're failing on the price piece because we don't really understand the pressures they're dealing with. What are they dealing with? Let me see. Come on, help me out here. You can use, by the way. So, okay, let's go through some real, uh, try and question, what is the most important thing to do? Try the question, what is the most important thing? Let's say you can't ask, Jim. Let's say you can't ask. You just have to know right now. Be that person. Uh, Hunter Harrington says, Inc. Dude, you're not helping me at all, Hunter, man. Dude, I'm liking you, but I don't understand you, man. All right, uh, Mike Janice. Okay, time, productivity, downtime, efficiency. Would the economic buyer be concerned with that? I would think the technical buyer or the operations buyer would be concerned with time, productivity, and efficiency. I'm not, I'm not discounting it, Mike. I think deeper on that one. I think it's the, you got the wrong profile. Uh, Performance, learning curve, mm, come on, man, work with me. Because remember, they're not, again, that's the operation. This is the buyer. So performance learning curve, right? Uh, the operations person is the person that should be in charge of how long is it going to take this to get going. So I think somebody had, I think Jim again talked about, so let's pause here because Jim has a point here that too often they're focused on price. You think it's price, but they're worried about cost, right? And it's a great point you bring up, Jim, because... You think it's price, but in their mind, there's a hobgoblin saying, what's that really going to cost me, right? And so what they're really sometimes is called a TCO, which is the total cost of ownership, right? Because sometimes that's what they're really concerned about, the total cost of ownership. It's not the one-time price I'm paying. What's this really going to cost me? How's this really going to impact? And that's where you may make the argument about efficiency and performance a little bit, right? But what's the real cost of ownership? And in this case, what a lot of companies worry about, again, you can cut it different ways, is that maybe if I buy this today, uh, what are going to be the maintenance costs? What's going to be the servicing costs? What about the warranty costs? What about the replacement part costs? Is that included in the maintenance or is that additional? So forth and so on. So they're concerned about that. So that's a great point. Uh, let me see. Instinct value, too soft. Value is too soft, man. I'm pushing you guys hard on that. Service support, and there it is. So now, renewal costs, right? Because then this would be almost right under here. What are the fees, right? Renewal costs. So you're absolutely right on that. I'm giving you that one, man. Mike, there you go. Let me take it out so you can see it. So renewal fees, renewal costs. In other words, what are some of the hidden costs? Jack Thomas says value. Come on, Jack. You're getting soft on me. Come on. Be specific. I'm not disagreeing with you. Uh, Hunter says instinct. I still don't know what that means. Uh, let me see. Reducing existing costs while increasing ROI. So they're trying to reduce costs, right? Because that's the whole thing. So they're trying to reduce, they're trying to push that number down because they're trying to create, remember, it's very simple, right? Here are the revenues, here's cost. This is what they're trying to do. And right here we have profit. So they're going to keep pushing this down so they can widen this profitability gap right here. So you're absolutely right. But beyond the numbers, I'm trying to push you guys beyond the numbers. You guys got the number piece down. Okay, Mike Janice, you said terms. I would stick that in here somewhere. What are the terms? Again, it's part of the deal, right? What's it really going to cost? All right, so let's see this. Okay, Jim's back. Show more dirt. When I sold vacuums door to door, you had to show them the dirt that you could clean up. So, but again, they're at the point they're buying already. So I'm with you on the differentiation, right? Because I remember those vacuum cleaner guys back in the day. You guys were really mean, by the way, because you would, you, would, you would clean one spot of my rug, right? And then if I didn't buy, I had to look at that clean spot. It was just a brilliant move. So, but that's another, 
that's another discussion, man, but it's brilliant. So you do have, but, but I love the analogy that you have to show them the dirt, which is what if they don't buy from you, what do they stand to lose? So again, this could fall under the cost. I'm pushing you guys to think beyond the money here for a second. Okay, what is the impact? I'm giving you a hint now, because I'm pushing you guys. You're not with me here, man. What is the impact on that buyer? I'm not giving you any more. What's the impact on the buyer? I'll give you a hint. What's the social impact on that buyer? Come on. What's the social impact on the buyer? Jim, I'm glad you have a good sense of humor for that carpet thing. All right. What's, what's the social impact? Here's what I would ask you to do, or consider. This economic buyer, this economic buyer has to justify their existence. Don't buyers have to do that? What is a buyer's job? See, the buyer... Put a, yeah, let's put a face on him, so to speak. This buyer has a boss, right? And this boss is always yelling at the buyer. And what is he yelling? Get the cost down, negotiate better, and they send these buyers to negotiation schools so they can negotiate better, right? They got to negotiate, 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 negotiate. That's what they're doing. So they have to look good in front of their boss's eyes by driving down price. But they also have to make sure that they're buying the best of the best because they're not always focused on price. Now, if you want, somebody mentioned differentiation. If I can show you how, if you went with a cheaper product, in the short term, it would be good, but in the long run, it would actually cost you more if it falls under cost. So maybe we can add differentiation here because what they're trying to find is differentiation. In other words, if I can convince them that, look, if you buy my product at 10 cents, let's say a dollar more per part, versus the one that's 75 cents, initially you'll pay 25 cents more, right? Assume massive volume here. But let me show you how this is not gonna impact. Now you can talk about the operation side. Because our parts have a warranty, because they can have, have a longer lifetime, you don't have downtime. Because you don't have downtime, that will impact your delivery. Somebody mentioned that, you were on the money. And because of delivery, they also don't have this. It won't impact your customer service. Your net promoter score won't go down because you failed to hit certain delivery. If you can tie that, then that's the story that this person needs to hear. So when they talk to their boss, they're going to say, look, the boss is going to say, why did you pay 25 cents more per part? He's going to be saying, here's why. And he's going to be able to tell them the whole story. So sometimes we have to train our buyer because the buyer sometimes isn't the person pushing down on price. It's his boss or her boss. And so we have to arm them with a good story as to why they should pay a little more so they can actually buy from us and in the long run actually win. So anyway, I think we beat that one to death. Uh, let me see. See, I got one here. Uh, Harman Brar. Hey, Victor, I was listening to your 10X conference speech. What a great sales mindset delivered by you, man. Thank you, man. So I, I did a uh, the first 10X with Grant Cardone. Uh, go check out my presentation. By the way, Harmon, I, do you realize in there that my the PowerPoint thing just totally broke? And so I had a, I wound up using a whiteboard, man. So I had to adjust really quick. The, the PowerPoint just died on me. Uh, so it's on, on YouTube, by the way. Check it out. If you're a manager and you're looking at market segmentation and how to grow or scale your revenue, you might want to check that one out. It's a good presentation. No fluff, just real good content. So, Armand, thank you very much, man. All right. Well, let me wrap up with that. So hopefully, again, getting back to the Challenger sale. It's a great book. I highly recommend it. The concepts in there are actually... Uh, I mean, they're, they're really good because they're, they're very current and they apply to what's going on in the market. As we move towards this market, we're trying to get out of, look, the economy is taking a hit right now. And so for the next, who knows, three to six months, we're going to try to get out of this thing, right? And so now's a good time to actually read a book like The Challenger Sale because now that information in there was about a down economy. That book, again, it was the research began in 2009. Now, this is coming off the 2007-2008 economic implosion, you know, the Great Recession. So this was actually developed around that time. So what a better time to use it again like now because we're trying to come out of this again, which is why I wanted to talk about this book. Again, great book, great content, and got a couple more things here. Let me see. Harman said, yeah, saw that. Exactly. Yeah, thank you, man. So you, you understand my pain. So basically, targeting the sale to the main KPIs, targeting the sale to the, to the main KPI the buyer might have as a metric. That's correct. But also, 
that's, you know, th this was, you know, I would just add a little more spin on that one, Jesus. I would add this, that this part right here, the numbers, the profitability part, I'm with you. I'm with you on that, right? That You'll find some KPIs here. In this story, I want you to just kind of just slice it thinly and say, there is a social impact to the individual. The social impact is that if this person goes on the line for you, in other words, buys it more expensive, you have to help them tell the story up to their managers. And yes, it involves justifying it through KPIs that are important for them. But keep in mind the psychological and the personal impact of the actual buyer. Remember, their mandate is to reduce costs so they can increase profitability. Sales job is to get revenues. Economic buyer is to drive down the cost, profitability. But if you can tell them a great story, tie it to their KPIs, then I am 100%. But keep in mind that social impact, because sometimes people won't make a decision because they don't trust you. They know you might be a better product, but they go, you know, I don't know. I think I'm just going to go with the cheapest one because I know I won't get yelled at. But maybe if you can help them tell a better story, then they'll buy from you. So it's a good point you bring up, man. Let me see who's this. Um, Jim, ah, Tennessee. I love Tennessee, man. Nashville, Tennessee. All right, guys, with that, I think we've been on here almost an hour. Again, if you like that, hit that like button. Uh, leave some comments, feedbacks, or maybe some ideas for future you know, presentation. Jesus, you're very welcome. And I enjoy doing this. And again, I'm gonna try to schedule them eventually. Uh, but right now, I just again, doing a couple of random. I got a couple more questions jumping in. Wait a minute, what's this one right here? Let me just grab this one. Hi, Victor. Great to see you in live videos, and I follow you regularly. Any advice, tips on what to say to get some top referrals from clients or even customers referring other customers? Kanishka, we're going to leave that for another one. Uh, by the way, but if you're a member of the Sales Velocity Academy, I have a program on referrals as well with scripts, so check that out. Uh, Jim, I have no idea what song you're talking about. Give me, <laughs> and by the way, social proof stories are huge. So yeah, by the way, social proof stories or case studies, and this is what people want. So Mike, you're absolutely right, man. So you guys are on it, man. You're very welcome. And on that note, guys, again, thank you for joining me. As always, man, remember, selling ain't hard when you know how. That's my line. Uh, do me a favor, though. Again, if you love the content, hit the like button. But if you can do me one more favor, I always ask. very simple. Share this video with just one other person that may not be on here, man. Just spread the word, man. So on that note, thank you guys very much. Have a great night.